Hello, folks. Welcome to our uh, webinar broadcast. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about video conferencing, uh, Silicon Valley's 50 year history. Let's go to the next slide. So our agenda today is first I'll talk, uh, I'm Tom Coughlin, by the way, and I'm a past president of IEEE USA. I've also been a local volunteer and a volunteer in the IEEE Region 6. And uh, I'm going to be giving an, and I'm the chair this year of the uh, Silicon Valley Technology History Committee. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, after that, Brian Berg, uh, who is the vice chair of our committee, uh, will be talking about IEEE historical milestones. And then we'll have our main event, which is looking at the 50 year history of video conferencing. Next slide. So here's our, the members of our committee. I'm the chair, Brian's vice chair. Tom Gardner is the treasurer. Uh, Ken Pyle, uh, who is going to be the moderator for, our dis for the discussion later on, is our videographer as well. And then we have some at-large members who have been very helpful to us, Francine Belson, Paul Wessling, Ted Hoff, and Alan Weisberger. Next slide. So our uh, Technology History Committee, IEEE Silicon Valley Technology History Committee was founded in, 19, in 2013. And our purpose is to hold meetings on the history of a broad range of technologies. And they're basically things that were conceived, developed, or a lot of work was done um, in the greater Silicon Valley area. So if you're interested in offering your help, you can get a hold of me, Tom Coughlin, at tomcoughlin at IEEE.org, or Brian Berg at b.berg at IEEE.org. For instance, we're always looking for new topics uh, people who might help to organize a session or think that we should be doing something. So uh, don't be afraid to get a hold of us and let us know. Next slide. So we've been uh, in operation since 2013 and looking at the last few years, here's some of the activities we've done. Uh, October of 2019, uh, we had a talk on the partial history of makers in Silicon Valley. Uh, the maker fairs uh, started in San Mateo. And, and so we had a lot of people who were involved in the maker community there. On June 13th, uh, we had a talk on recovery of data from damaged shapes that had been under uh, ocean water for many months uh, from the Challenger shuttle disaster. In October 2018, we had a, a panel of people who were involved in initial work on the gravity uh, wave detector, LIGO, and talking about the history of, uh, of, uh, of that activity. Uh, September 2014, uh, we had a talk on dialogue uh, and the beginning of online search. And in March 2017, we talked, we had a session on the other women of ENIAC and rethinking IT innovation. Next slide. So we have uh, one other event uh, scheduled so far for this year, but as I said before, we're open to doing other events if people would like, especially if someone would like to help champion it. In October uh, 2020, October 8th, we'll have a session on Lockheed's Ag Agena, America's first spy satellite and uh, talking about looking from above the Iron Curtain. And you can find out more about, uh, about our activities, our past and upcoming events, um, many of which are recorded. So you can get access to that as well at siliconvalleyhistory.com. Next slide. So that's, uh, that's talking a little bit about uh, the Silicon Valley Technology History Committee. I'd like to introduce you to Brian Berg. And Brian Berg is a uh, Region 6, in addition to being the chair of our History Committee, and the past uh, vice chair of the history committee and past chair. He is also region six history chair. He is also a milestone coordinator for IEEE region six, which is the Western United States. Um, he's uh, been very involved in the consultants network of Silicon Valley. He's a past chair and he's been uh, on the board of directors for several years. Um, and he was also the Santa Clara Valley section past chair as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Brian. He'll be talking to you about milestones. Great, great. Happy to have you all here. And see, I believe the got my video going here. Great. So anyway, just want to tell you a little bit about some of the IEEE milestones that uh, we've dedicated here locally. I know a number of you were at the uh, dedication last year for the Dialogue Online Search System. In fact, we had uh, an event, as Tom Coffin noted a couple minutes ago, um, back in 2017, uh, about this Dialogue Search Engine. Was, we had a full house for that event. And that got me inspired to work with Roger Summit, who had um, originated this back in 1966 uh, at Lockheed. Um, it was actually the very first um, 
uh, online search system. The first customer for that was NASA Ames Research Center, and then uh, NASA all over the country started using it. It spread to Europe, and it's still in use today. In fact, as you can see from the photograph on the right, uh, we had attendees from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in San Jose, including the director of that office, because they, uh, that search engine is used to this day as part of patent searches. So it was a great event. Uh, another um, a milestone that we've uh, done is uh, last year for the Lunar Laser Ranging Experiment. So on August 1st of last year, that was the 50th anniversary to the day, the first time that a laser had been sent to the moon and reflected back in the distance to the moon uh, calculated with centimeter accuracy. We commemorated that by um, uh, unveiling a plaque in the lobby of the Shane Telescope up at Lick Observatory. You can see that photograph in the middle. And the gentleman um, who worked on that, um, uh, standing next to the plaque, um, he actually did the work 50 years earlier on this project. And um, so it was, it was quite a neat event. We also had an evening event at the um, uh, TI uh, Conference Center for that event. Uh, some upcoming milestones. Uh, we were actually going to unveil uh, plaques for the Apple I, Apple II, and Macintosh in May. Because of the COVID crisis, that's been delayed, unfortunately. We have another upcoming one for the Xerox Alto computer. There's one that I worked on uh, for the Intel 4004, and the plan is to dedicate that in November of 2021 for the 50th anniversary of the single chip microprocessor, Intel 4004. We also had a uh, plan for um, unveiling three plaques in three different regions, one in Washington State, one in Louisiana, and one in Pisa, Italy for the gravitational wave antenna. And this is another one of these um, technologies that was discussed at an earlier event for a tech history committee. Unfortunately, that was also delayed because of the COVID crisis, but we eventually will be unveiling those um, talks. Another um, milestone that I just started with folks up in Oregon um, for the universe of serial bus. So we plan to dedicate that at some point next year. So a lot of stuff happening in the world of IEEE milestones. And I've been very involved with it and it's been a fun part of the world. Happy to have you all here today. Take it away, Ken. Ryan, yeah, I, thank you. Yeah, thank just a quick oh, go ahead. Ken, Ken is our videographer uh, for the Tech History Committee, and um, he's been involved with many of these events, and he organized this event today. Thanks very much for all the work you put into this, Ken. Take it away. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the committee. I, I just want to expand a little bit on what Brian talked about as far as these past stories, and, and it's about technology, of course, but it is about the stories, and that uh, the Lure project last year uh, it was a very touching uh, story of a, a man and how he overcame a lot of obstacles to get where he was. And the one impression I have, and I recommend everyone go back and watch the video, but his, his thing was, he said, watch the Green Book to really understand what it was like for a black man in the 1960s uh, in the South. And it was uh, you know, something that went beyond technology. So I think the work that Tom and Brian and Alan Weisberger and, and Tom have, have are doing here is important beyond just the, the history of the technology, it's the stories of the people. And, and today we'll hear some of the stories of video conferencing in the Silicon Valley in the 1980s and 1990s, maybe a little bit in the 70s. And I'm so pleased we've got, and I don't know where they are show up on your screen, but we've got, um, we'll do them in the order that they're going to be presenting. Uh, Dave House from Intel, and I'll present a little bit more about him. Uh, Eric Dorsey, who was formerly with uh, CLI, and Dave is no longer with Intel, I should make that clear, and Brian Martin, uh, 8 by 8 He was there 30 years ago, and he's there today. So thank you all for, for joining us uh, with this. And with that, Brian, if you can unshare your screen, I will attempt to share a screen here. And there it should be. Okay, hopefully everyone sees this. We will just kind of skip to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Now we're just skipping right through. Okay, so what we'll talk a little bit, I'm going to set things up uh, in the next few minutes to put things in context. Uh, a block diagram, which is always important for engineers to, to see. Uh, we'll go a little bit of the history outside of our scope today, just to kind of center us in the idea that uh, it seems like Silicon Valley in this decade is the center of the world, but 
it goes beyond us, of course. And then we'll uh, we'll actually get the, to the panelists. So this block diagram is uh, just a real simplification of the challenges. I mean, to the left here, you've got the things you need. You need a, a camera like we all have here today, a speaker or a microphone rather. You need these sensing devices. And, and then you need to be able to display it. You need to be able to hear it. And, and then you need to be able to somehow take those inputs or outputs as they, they may be and put them into a format that you can transmit them over a communications network. Of course, in the early days, that would have been analog. So you're talking about some kind of modulation onto a, a carrier of some sort. As things progressed, and we'll mostly focus on digital communications, you have to uh, analog to digital and digital to analog into some kind of codec. And then you need to have some sort of communications interface to, um, uh, to the world, all right, to some sort of network, whether that be an ISDN network or in today's world, a broadband network. And ideally, you want a situation like this. Uh, it's great to talk one-on-one, -on -one, but occasionally you want to have a meeting and talk to other people. So you need something in the middle, some sort of bridging function, like a multi-point uh, conferencing unit. So that's just to set the stage for today. But let's go way back in time, and I'm only going to spend a moment on this. Um, the idea of transmitting images almost started at the time of the telegraph. And in 1843, there was some guy in Scotland. And by 1865, there was someone in France who had actually commercialized the ability to send images over telegraph wires. And it became a commercial service. In the first year, 5,000 of these faxes were used to uh, transmit uh, signatures for banking, ver signature verification for banking. And really just a short time later, really after you had invention of telephone and light bulb, all these things coming together, uh, the cartoonist, uh, a cartoonist had this vision in Paul Pentius Almanac of a, um, a, a parent, a parent's talking to their children, watching them through a big screen and hearing what they're saying. And I think the children could see them. So they had this concept well before the technology was there. And of course, everyone probably remembers in 1927, uh, not only was the year my mom was born, but it was the year that uh, Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover saw video and they had a two-way audio conversation. That was courtesy of AT&T. And a few years later, they did that in um, for two-way video as well as two-way audio. And and again, I, I tend to be U.S. centric, but the reality was other countries were probably ahead of the U.S. In Germany, uh, by the late 30s, mid 30s, they actually had a two-way video conferencing system that was commercial between some of the larger cities like Hamburg to Berlin. And these were kind of, I guess, the modern day, what would be considered a video conferencing room. And they actually had them available. And it wasn't, um, uh, you know, these were eight inch screens, uh, 25 frames per second, 180 lines, apparently. And it was a high enough resolution, you could see the uh, hands on a wristwatch. So it's real easy to think everyone was, everything was invented here in the United States and in Silicon Valley. So if, uh, if the panelists can turn off their videos, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, but uh, after the war, AT&T took the lead, of course, in the United States. And uh, we can't, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't mention something about Shannon and his uh, seminal paper, the mathematical theory of communication and the idea of, you know, what is the minimum that you need to send to get the signal through the path and, and recover it. And I think Eric will talk a little bit more about that when, we, uh, when he focuses on compression. But even then, 1948, uh, one of the AT&T engineers had this vision of uh, when a child is born that they would have, he would have, or she would have a phone number that would be associated with them. And at some point, he or she would be able to make a call to their, his friend, his or her friend. Um, and in the 50s, they started working on uh, on this concept, 1964 World's Fair, of course, the big demonstrations, there's an image of Lady Bird uh, Johnson. And then finally, in 1970, uh, they came out with the commercial service in Pittsburgh. And technically, it worked, but it wasn't ready for prime time. And they shut it down in 1978, which gets to uh, the topic of our discussion today. So the, this graphic is really just intended to illustrate some of the relationships, uh, whether those relationships are company to company, 
Um, maybe a company had acquired a company, maybe they had acquired a technology. It's to represent maybe where some of the key employees had worked prior to being at that company. And it's also uh, maybe geographically to show where they were. Some of them were kind of dead end. I have to mention this one because I worked there in the 1980s, a company called Cattell. It was an analog system mostly for cable TV, but in fact, and I'm pointing to an IEEE uh, paper that was written in 1981 that was a real use case of two-way land mobile radio, two-way video, two-way audio, uh, and even some PCM data over uh, a coax in the fiber system. I think it was his coax probably at that point. Uh, Atari Tel, another one from the Atari, which there's another Silicon Valley history uh, panel on that you should watch if you haven't. Uh, Atari Tel uh, was bought by Mitsubishi in the early 1980s. Picture Tel, of course, was a big success, but they were based in Massachusetts. So as successful as they were in this area, we're not really gonna focus on them much. C-Cube's another one, um, great compression technology, but again, its application seemed to be mostly in one-way video uh, for helping cable TV and satellite systems. And it made a big difference, of course. And then of course you get to this decade and everything is uh, the last two decades really. And everything has, has changed. And we'll talk a little bit about kind of where things are going when we wrap up with Brian Martin. Um, but what we're gonna focus on today is Intel's role in really being a, a driver in many ways of video conferencing in the nineties and uh, CLI compression labs and eight by eight. So with that, it's, it's really my privilege and honor, and I'm gonna stop the screen share in a moment, but you can go ahead and turn your video on, Dave, and then I'll, uh, I'll while I introduce you. Um, Dave House, he could really be called Mr. Intel Inside. He's, he and his team came up with that, that phrase that is world, world known, of course, or uh, very famous. Um, but Dave also has some very interesting stories and he will give us the inside track of what some of the technologies like DVI that really changed the business. And some of these headlines, you know, talks about what happened. So with that, I'm going to stop the screen sharing, turn my video off. And Dave, let's hear some of these stories and uh, look forward to it. Well, uh, video on the PC, which is the thing I'll talk about, uh, happened a long time ago. It happened really during the 80s into the 90s. Uh, 1980 is 40 years ago. It's kind of hard to remember the context. So it was the work in the 70s that really got us into the point where we could think about video. 74 is when I joined Intel. And uh, shortly after, we introduced the 8080. The 8086 and 8088 were uh, introduced in 78 when I became uh, general manager of the microprocessor business. And I managed that the general manager for the next th uh, 13 years. And uh, probably one of the biggest things that happened, of course, in those days, we were competing with Zilog and we were competing with Motorola on a microprocessor basis. That's another topic, another history. But a big event happened in August of 1981. The PC was born, was introduced. And uh, IBM then uh, controlled basically that business. They introduced the XT and 83, the PC-80 and 84. Well, during this time, actually in the 70s, I became, uh, started talking, meeting regularly with Bill Gates. That's before Bill Gates was Bill Gates. Nobody <laughs> knew who was. And uh, we would talk and argue about all the different things about the PC platform because he was applying uh, various software to our customers and then uh, the basic operating system DOS uh, to the IBM PC in 81. So the meetings got a lot more intense after that. And one thing that Bill got very excited about with me and our meetings was this up and coming thing called a CD-ROM. It had uh, 500 megabytes of data. It had a 1.2 megabit uh, data stream. And he got very excited. And as a result, he, 1986, uh, he created the CD-ROM conference number one. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, we're now up to the mid 80s and Intel uh, has introduced the 286 and 82 and the 386 and 85. And basically what we were concerned about is we're increasing this power, the performance is doubling every 18 months, transistor count every 24 months. Uh, how are people going to use all this computing power? What are, what, 
how are we going to sell this and, and make this advanced power uh, more attractive? And we hit on video. Video would be very important. It take, took a lot of uh, capacity. It wasn't possible to play video on the PC at that time. Well, the same year that is the AT uh, and, uh, and Bill got very excited and telling me about the CD-ROM, there was a little development that started at the David Sardoff Research Center at RCA called Digital Video Interactive. And uh, sometime about, well, exactly in, in 86, uh, GE bought the Sarnoff Labs and got titles of that technology. But in 85 time, time frame, Bill was telling me how wonderful this video interactive is. So I went, BVI, and so I went and uh, visited them at uh, some point in time in Princeton and saw what they had. And they had a personal computer, remember the old box, they cut the top out and they had these big tall boards that they plugged in. And one board was a video board and another board was an audio board and another board was a CD-ROM controller. And they said, if we could just integrate this stuff, you know, this would be uh, a very strong technology. And uh, so I became interested and we started meeting and we started talking and after GE had bought RCA and, and decided that the labs was not that important. They decided that they wanted to sell the DVI technology. And Bill, of course, came to me immediately, says, you ought to go buy it. And I went and looked and I started negotiating with uh, General Electric on this. And, and eventually I, I, I signed a, a contract. I was talking to IBM at the same time because they wanted to see video on the PC and, and uh, actually struck a deal with IBM to give us uh, $5 million for certain rights. And then I took $5 million and I bought the technology from GE. So it cost Intel no money, but we got the technology. Uh, I don't know if IBM knows that to this date, but now they do. Uh, so uh, so uh, before the actual purchase, so 87, uh, the DVI team had taken their demo uh, to CD-ROM conference 2.0. And they blew it away. There's an article that went earlier about uh, how the shocker at the CD-ROM conference, D DVI blows away uh, CDI, Philips loses out, Microsoft cashes in. Um, so that was the big news. And that was the context in which I went and acquired this initial technology. Now, uh, Wikipedia says that digital interactive is the DVI is the first multimedia desktop video standard for IBM compatible personal computers. It enables full screen, full motion video, as well as stereo audio, still images, graphics to be presented on a DOS-based desktop computer using special compression chipset. Uh, so it was the first, at least according to Wikipedia, the first standard for the IBM uh, PC. Now, to put this in context, it was 1985 when Windows 1.0 Interface Manager came out in 87, the Windows 2.0 came out and the first real version of Windows we all know was Windows 3.0, it came out in 1990. So we're dealing back in the days of, of, of DOS. The other thing that I should mention is that yes, we could full play full screen, 30 frames a second video. We were doing some very special compression, uh, the, the, the kind of the pre, cursor to what MPEG does to, uh, today. And, uh, but uh, we couldn't compress it in real time on the PC of that day. Uh, so we use a VAX and it took a long time to take a video and run it through the VAX and get it compressed to the point where we could play it back on a, on a personal computer. Uh, Intel went to work right away after the purchase to reduce this to silicon, that was the deal, the 80, 750 was a chipset, um, a graphics chip and an audio chip uh, that would handle the decompression. And so uh, we're, we're back in the, the 80s and uh, we're promoting, uh, you really need to have video and the importance of video. And in 1991 um, is the year I left the microprocessor group management and became the marketing manager, but I also created a group that I created before I took with me called the Intel Architecture Labs. The Intel Architecture Labs was job was to work on things before they were ready to be worked on as a product. 
So they were doing uh, experimentation in various ways. And we started doing various work on video. And out of there came the video uh, instruction sets that we added into the uh, Intel microprocessor called MMX uh, instructions to make it uh, easier, better, or faster on the newer generation uh, microprocessors, uh, such as the Pentium. 486 came out in 89, the, the Pentium a little after that. Uh, so that we added those capabilities. We also started participating in the MPEG committees and all the standardization efforts, et cetera. Uh, what led up to that is a product called ProShare. And I went on, um, I went on the, uh, the, uh, the web and eBay and I bought myself uh, my own Intel ProShare Video 500. And this was a complete uh, product it came with the software on a DVROM. It came with a full set of instruction, instruction manual, and quick instruction. It came with a board that had special chips on it to do the compression plugged into the IBM PC bus. Then there are all kinds of cables and everything else. And there was a camera with it. Uh, the sort of the thing that kept the, I, this uh, product from becoming the uh, industry standard or a widely successful product is we needed bandwidth. And uh, the only available bandwidth at that time was I ISDN. So we worked to have, uh, we made it DS uh, ISDN compatible. Now people are having trouble getting ISDN. So I went out and I talked to all the RBOX and we basically signed up the RBOX to be sales distribution channel for ProShare. And the whole deal is you can get to sell ISDN and you can sell ProShare products, which is why you need it. And we can do full video conference and sharing and documents and all that sort of thing on ProShare at this point in, in time. Pictures, video, watch the other person, full audio capability. Uh, we had ability to share. We had some share tools that allow people on both ends to make comments or markups on a document. So it was a fairly decent set of software uh, by that point in time. Uh, the problem is uh, the RBOX never got very good at delivering ISDN. <laughs> it was a pain to get an ISDN line. They were not always available. We came out with a plan with the RBOX called Intel Blue. And Intel Blue was, I want uh, a ProShare. So whatever package, because there were all these things to be configured with uh, ISDN with, from the RBOX. All of this uh, we, want, we wanted to make simple. So you just ordered Intel Blue and that's what you needed uh, uh, for ProShare. So um, we, we uh, continue to work obviously to add the capabilities in the machine to do uh, uh, instructions, wrist tile instructions that is single uh, clock, no microcode uh, involved instructions so we could do better and better on video. But we always uh, felt that the, the, op, the, 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 the thing that was going to do here is this was going to drive uh, the demand. So uh, that's my story. I'm going to pass things on. Uh, Eric is on uh, next. So Eric, do you want to pick it up? Yes, thanks, Dave. I'm uh, Eric Dorsey, and uh, I uh, was at CLI from 1987 to 1998. And uh, I was responsible for the uh, software group uh, that did the video, audio, uh, telecommunications, uh, and networking subsystems. So first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some key dates and milestones in the 80s and 90s in video conferencing. So 1978, uh, Compression Labs was founded. Uh, Wen Chen was the CTO, and he was there the entire uh, time till CLI was purchased. And he was key because in a, after a few years, he had amassed over a dozen key patents in the DCT and in zigzag scan and real length encoding, which were central to the algorithms that we'll be talking about. And in 1982, CLI introduced their first product, uh, which was $250,000. Of course, you needed two, so you have to spend $500,000. And then you would communicate between these two units using a, a least T1 line at $1,000 an hour. So a little different than today. And then in 1986, PictureTel, who was 
uh, CLI's biggest competitor, where they were, they were located in the Boston area, released their product and it was based on vector quantization. It sold for about $80,000. And a couple of years later, in 1988, CLI released the Rembrandt 2 for 30,000 using a couple dozen TI C30 DSPs. They were the first floating point uh, DSPs introduced by TI. And the video subsystem alone took 23 uh, DSPs. Then shortly after that, we started working with IIT, which then became API later. And they had a chipset called the VPC, which greatly reduced the complexity of the video uh, subsystem, which would allow us to reduce the price to about $20,000. And then in 1992, we partnered with AT&T to produce the world's first analog video phone. And it was over a 19.2 kilobits per second modem, where 10,000 of those bits per second were allocated to video and the rest were uh, audio uh, and system layer. And then 1997, VTAL actually uh, bought CLI, which was a company down in Texas, and uh, Polycom uh, buys PictureTel. Even today, Polycom is one of the largest video conferencing uh, companies in the world. And then in, 19, in 2006, Cisco introduces their telepresence product line, which is a very high-end product line, which is still used today, um, multiple monitors, multiple cameras. So next slide. So here's just a couple of photos of those products. On the left is the uh, CLI Rembrandt 2 VP, VP. When you can tell there are going to be several different PC boards in the, once you open the top of that chassis for all the different subsystems. And then on the right is the AT&T video phone uh, where CLI just did the video part. Uh, AT&T did the audio, the modem, and the uh, mechanicals. And those sold for $1,500 each. Now, some of the key dates in kind of video compressions and standards are, now in 1988 was the date when the first international video uh, standard was introduced and it was H called H.261 and it was managed by the CCITT group, which is an international telecommunication group, which has now been renamed ITU. And it started out with about 12 companies um, to introduce algorithms and submit algorithms from Apple, Microsoft, Intel, C-Cube, uh, Tidal, CLI. But in the end, it came down to two companies. There was the CLI camp, which was based on the DCT. And then there was the picture tell camp, which was based on vector quantization. But CLI, they donated, they offered to donate all of their patents royalty free to the consortium, which tipped the balance to uh, CLI's favor. And, all that, and there, or it was based on the DCT uh, and other algorithms developed by CLI. And all other video standards that after that were also based on the DCT. So it's a, it's a seminal moment in video compression. If they had chosen vector quantization, of course, you'd have very different algorithms today. Could be better today, could be worse, well, no, but it would definitely be different. Then in 1995, the H.262 algorithm was uh, introduced. It's also known as the MPEG-2 standard. And it was used in broadcast video, like digital cable, digital satellite, as well as in the uh, in DVD standard. Then in about a year later, H.263 came out, which is very similar, but it was more for video conferencing over broadband use and it introduced low latency. And the Polycom in particular used that a lot. Then 2003, H.264 came out, which is also known as MPEG-4, and it's still in, in use today. And pretty much you know, all HD broadcast and well, a lot of uh, uh, streaming over the web uh, is done by use uh, H.264. It's also the standard that's used in uh, Blu-ray DVD and it has wider color gamuts and color depths and supports multiple sizes of DCTs besides the tape. Now, in, and in 2013, H.265 came out, which is also known as HEVD, high efficiency video coding, which supports up to 8K televisions. And that was used in the 4K Blu-ray player standard. Uh, and then, in 2019, so this is the last year, the AV1 came out, which was an open source video standard with a consortium of companies kind of led by Google because the work was based on the original VP10 codec that Google uses for uh, YouTube. Uh, and then just this month, uh, H.266 was uh, ratified. Uh, and so it's going to support fractional frame rates up to 120 frames per second, HDR, up to 10,000 nits and a wider uh, color gamut. Okay. 
So next slide. So since we don't have a lot of time to go through kind of a deep dive on the algorithms for video compression, I'm just going to mention the four key elements. And these four elements are in every video standard, even AV1, that were mentioned on the prior slide. So in the beginning, the frames are broken up into different blocks in the pixel domain. Typically, they're eight by eight, but now you can use four by four as well. So, but zoom eight by eight will pick up the, the blocks, and then you would take the differential between the previous frame of that block. But if there's actual motion, let's been walking across the screen, first it applies motion estimation so that the block that it's attracted from is first dis dislocated by the motion vector, so you can get a more efficient uh, differential error. And then that differential error is then uh, in the DCT, the discrete cosine transform, which is essentially a two-dimensional FFT, which flips all the pixels into the frequency domain, and they're quantized, and then entropy encoding is applied, uh, which is based on, is a, a lossless encoding based on Claude Shannon's source coding theorem, where the length of each code word it's approximately proportional to the negative logarithm of the probability of occurrence of the code word, which in other words, if you have a code word that's very frequent use, then it would be assigned few number of bits, whereas a very infrequent code word will have a larger number of bits. A key example would be the Morse code, where you have letters like E and S use a very small number of dots and dashes, letters like Q and Z have more. Um, and in video compression, typically arithmetic coding and uh, 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 encoding are the two most common. So this is a, a slide that kind of demonstrates what I mean by motion estimation. So you have two different frames, the previous frame, the current frame. You've got a man walking across. And so if you were to use the same block in both frames to create the differential error, you wouldn't be optimum you know, in the area of the frame where the man is walking. So instead you do motion estimation and use a dislocated block uh, from the using the motion vector before you subtract the two blocks. So then the next slide. So here's an example of DCT encoding. So with an eight by eight, you do a, when you do the forward DCT, you end up with, again, 64 coefficients. So the upper left-hand coefficient is the DC offset of the block, and the lower right coefficient represents the highest frequency. And as you zigzag from the upper left to the lower right, low to high frequency. And then you would quantize that block. And on the right side there, you see a quantized block. And typically, all the high frequencies go to zero. So it's very efficient when you do a run length encoding uh, of that block. And that's transmitted to the decoder. And then you do the uh, reverse quantization. You do the inverse DCT. And then you add back in the previous uh, the, the differential memory from the previous frame to create the current frame. Now, of course, depending on how much those, D, those DCT elements are quantized, you might have blocking artifacts. And you'll see that if you have, you start up a stream, you know, for example, with Netflix and it doesn't know what kind of bandwidth you have and assign to low bandwidth, you can actually see those blocks. But as the bandwidth increases, then those artifacts go away. So I'm now going to uh, so. pass it over to uh, Brian Martin. Yeah, and I just wanted to jump in there. We'll have time for some questions and answers. Uh, and I think uh, during that, we actually had some audio compression issues or transmission issues. So there was a little distortion. So we may have some questions on that. But with that, I'd like to bring in Brian. Uh, Brian Martin, uh, you've been involved in this from the very beginning to the present. So I think you'll be a bridge from yesterday to today. So yeah, thanks, Ken. Thank you, Eric. Um, Great to be here. Uh, it's, it's amazing, I think, uh, not just the fact that uh, 8 by 8 is still around today. That, that's an achievement in and of itself. But um, you know, as Eric so aptly explained, uh, we, we named ourselves at the time after the basic building block of video compression. If we were naming ourselves today, we'd be 1 by 4, 4 by 4, something probably a little, little less catchy. Um, but it, it was great to catch up with Eric again. Eric was actually one of 8x8s. At the time, we were called IIT, Integrated Information Technology, in 1990. Uh, Compression Labs was one of our very first video customers and, and one of our, our largest partners that helped us get into the video phone. I'll tell that story in a minute. But I want to kind of take it down to the, the silicon level and what we were doing. Uh, as Eric mentioned, you know, Compression Labs have been using this massive, must have been uh, a huge source of revenue for TI because they were buying so many general purpose DSPs. 
And 8 Byte started working uh, when I joined the company in 1990 on building a dedicated piece of silicon for video processing. So if you go to the next uh, slide, Ken, uh, it was called the Vision Processor. Uh, I don't even want to go into what geometries and so forth, but essentially it, it was a it was a dedicated SIMD architecture, single instruction, multiple data that was designed to do video processing. But because we had all these different standards floating around, we had 261 and, and soon to be 263 and today 264, different protocols that were being supported, um, some proprietary compression. So the, the AT&T video phone was using a compression labs developed very low bit rate algorithm called CTX. And we had to support all of these. So we made it a programmable video chip uh, and, and have, you know, it's kind of our story of how we morphed from being silicon to software to where we are today. Uh, I was just out of school, so I had this great idea of why don't we put our faces on the first chip. Uh, so you can see that in the left, uh, left to right there, you've got Headley Rainey, who I believe is working at Marvell today, myself, uh, Chishin Wang, who was the co-founder of IIT, Jan Fondrianto, who has sold um, many a voice and video company to uh, Cisco and others over his career. Sehat Satarja next to Jan, uh, who of course co-founded Marvell with uh, his brother. Um, and then Choi Lu, who was our layout designer. These were full custom chips at the time. Uh, you'll notice my shirt looks a little different from everyone else because I got the job of actually dithering this into the metal. Uh, I didn't like how our heads were floating when the, when the image came out. And so I, I went ahead and colored my shirt in. I didn't have time to color everyone else's shirt in. Uh, and if you're wondering why it's so low resolution, this was off of a Polaroid photo <laughs> and who knows what we scanned it with at the time. So anyway, go on. Um, the, the problem with being a chip maker selling to people like Compression Labs, and we sold to VTEL, British Telecom, PictureTel, all those names, uh, was in a good quarter, we might sell, in a great quarter, we might sell 50,000 chips. And in a typical quarter, we'd only sell 20 or 30,000 chips. And so 8 by went on to kind of vertically integrate itself and take our silicon and software technology and actually beginning in 96, trying to drive the price of those systems down. Uh, Eric mentioned $20,000 for that Rembrandt 2 VP. Uh, we came to market with a product line we called Via TV. We called it that because it was a set-top box that used your existing television as the monitor. Uh, it, you plugged your phone line in the house into the back of it, and then you plugged a telephone uh, into another jack on the device. And then there was a built-in modem and camera and all the circuitry. And you turned it on, you called your friends over the PSTN. They had to have one too, of course. You would hit pound and one in DTMF, and that would signal both modems to turn on and sync. And, and H324 had become an established uh, international standard by then. Re really amazing that all these constructs that Eric talked about, you know, the, the way, the fundamental ways video compression was done back then uh, are still relevant uh, today, so many years later. Uh, and I think it, it's a testament to the strength of the ITU and, and all the smart people and some of the names that, that Dave and Eric mentioned in their presentation were key players there. So anyway, we, we sold half a million of these units. Wow. Uh, we eventually got the price down to 349. Uh, I remember standing in the aisles at Fry's, hawking these on the weekend, uh, trying to show people they could turn their television into a video phone. Um, someone in the in the Q and A, and feel free to ask questions there. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, had asked like, when did H three two three and IP kind of start becoming popular? And so, following on you know the heels of this time frame ninety seven, ninety eight, ninety nine, we all took these technologies and moved them to the IP network. H three two three was the dominant protocol. Um, Eight byte itself got invited to join uh, an organization called Cable Labs out in Colorado, which was the North American Consortium for Stand. They're the ones that invented DOCSIS. Uh, they also, uh, we helped co-author a spec that was called Packet Cable, which was basically how do you do two-way video over cable plants? And it was through that experience that I saw firsthand that no one in the cable industry, and, and we later kind of generalized this, was interested in two-way video at the time, but they were all super interested in two-way voice and, and how voice could be sent over cable and IP networks. And so if you go to the next slide, can 8Byte actually embrace that and introduced along with others like Vonage at the time, uh, home phone replacement services for those telephone circuits. Uh, we called ours Packet 8. We called it that because it wasn't entirely clear in 2002, 2003, 
whether it was actually legal to be replacing home phone lines with IP-based uh, voice. Uh, and, and eventually, you know, that all got clarified by the FCC circa 94. And, you know, to this oh, day- 2004, you mean? I'm sorry, 2004, yeah, sorry. yeah, sorry. There's too many decades at work on this call. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you, Ken. Um, the, the interesting thing is video remained a part of what 8x8 and others offered in these services, but we just did not see adoption. So no matter how low we made the price, um, and it's funny when you attack a, a business model with a certain mindset, you know, I had been a hardware person from day one. You know, our original business model was, hey, let's, let's sell hardware, let's sell video phones, and then we'll give the service away. And the way that got turned on its head and, and what's common today is, of course, a SaaS model where you sell a recurring service and you subsidize or, or actually give away the hardware. So the point is video just never did, you know, it, it kept evolving. I think the period from when I'm talking about to today, you know, there's been this huge revolution in both the processing power that Intel and others have, have given us. So we went from having a world where you had to have a dedicated encoder, you had to have hardware DSP capabilities to where everything could be done in software. And Tom, I'm glad you told the MMX story because I, I had totally blanked on that from my, from my memory banks. But uh, <laughs> the moment you started talking about that, I remember those days as well. So the processor could, could do everything in software. And so the need for hardware went away. Um, and today, you know, the public cloud is really filling in uh, Ken had mentioned this need for this video bridge in the middle to mix all these video streams together and, and generate the experience we're all viewing today. Uh, and the public cloud has really made that super easy to do. Uh, you don't need reservations to do it. You just spin up more and more compute as you need it as a conference gets bigger and bigger. Um, so the compute side certainly has, is, is night and day. Um, at the same time, the transport, you know, you heard ISDN lines, that's where I started in 1990. Um, our early IP kind of commonly available uh, networks in some parts of the world are still DSL based today. You know, they were great on the downstream side, but the upstream side with only 128 kilobits, you were really limited with the number of voice or video channels you could carry over that. And so the move to fiber the move to um, you know, the, the Wi-Fi we have available today that, that can really do uh, you know, approaching gigabit speeds and what's going on with 5G, that also worked in all of our favor. And despite that, despite the fact that people started adopting Zoom and 8x8 and other conferencing providers, it actually, from my perspective, took the global pandemic to change the world, and go to the next slide, Ken, from where we could do it to where we must do it. And I can tell you, um, 8 by 8 replatformed our video um, technology back in 2018. Uh, we, we bought a team from Atlassian that had been working on uh, an open source project called Jitsi. Uh, Jitsi, I think, is the largest open source community to do video conferencing today. It's a very active community, thousands of developers. They meet weekly uh, on Jitsi. Uh, feel free to look at jitsi.org or meet.jit.c uh, and, and try it out. And, and I think it's a great alternative. Uh, one of their, I don't know if it's a claim to fame, we're, we're very careful how we kind of position it. 8 by 8s the largest supporter of jitsi.org today. But um, Edward Snowden, the last couple of years uh, that he's been in exile, will do all of his visits on a Jitsi instance. Um, and it's a Jitsi instance that he can host on his own infrastructure. So one of the popular uses of Jitsi was if you don't trust the man in the middle or the country in the middle or the provider in the middle not to um, intercept your data, um, Jitsi was a great way. Anyone can build a Jitsi instance and host it privately themselves. So we continue to do that today. Um, Jitsi, we, we saw a usage spike from you know, a couple hundred thousand users a day to literally more than 25 million users in a matter of about three weeks. Um, and eight bytes usage is the same thing. And so again, the power of the public cloud enabling us to flex up and down. I think one of the most uh, revolutionary concepts in modern video conferencing today uh, is how you can spin up dynamically whatever resource you need. You're, you're not limited by ports. You're still limited by bandwidth. Uh, and then what's going on with WebRTC, we're on any browser, we can natively embed that encoder and decoder right into the browser itself. Uh, and there's really cool use cases we're going on in the contact center world 
where um, uh, vacation rental you know, contact centers can actually turn on, of course, with the end user's permission, the camera in the smartphone. Renter can't find the key that's hidden or can't find, figure out how to use the thermostat. Uh, the contact center can remotely say, hey, do you mind if we use your camera? Turn on the camera using WebRTC and literally hunt together as opposed to having to roll a truck and in this contact-free world we're living in, the use cases for that, whether it's manufacturing, getting the expert right onto the factory floor without having to travel. I mean, it's just endless. So that's a whole nother um, can of worms that I won't open any further, Ken, because I'm sure you, you can probably put it together into a, a future panel as, as history continues in this area. So I'll Yeah, and, and, and we had a conversation about this. This is kind of what drove this panel was uh, the conversation of, um, of that um, uh, and how you reacted to a, a case in, in Italy. I want to, before we go to all of our slides, I want to go back to Alan's uh, point. I had this chart here um, and it just shows, and Alan actually had, uh, had uh, found it. I guess I'll start my video. Um, and I think it's showing up. It, uh, in the 90s, um, Intel played a very key role in bringing the various uh, partners together, or vendors, other vendors. There was, a, I've heard as many as 150, 150 to figure out how to do standards around uh, H, uh, uh, you know, take the H.320 standards and create uh, new ones um, that could be done first on LAN. And then it turns out that that became better than ISDN as soon as the broadband became good enough. So I don't know if you wanted to expand on that, Brian, and maybe we can just go to, uh, everyone could turn their cameras back on. Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I always explained it and, and no one understood this, right? So that Via TV product, which was operating on a 19.2 on a kilobit modem, I always try to explain to people, you know, the less bandwidth you have, the harder it is to do video compression, right? Uh, and and people, you know, we were able to achieve maybe 15 frames per second of what Eric referred to as CIF. It was called CIF, uh, 352 by 288 pixels on a TV at the time, right before HD TV. You could then double that and just scale it, and and the image would look okay. But the amount of processing power that it took to to take a, a captured video stream and squeeze it down into something that would go over modem and still have put the voice over the same stream. Uh, it's just, it was so hard. So, you know, we live in the easy days today with all this compute power and all the advances that, that Intel have brought us uh, to where we don't have to worry about those constraints anymore. It's, it's awesome from my perspective. Yeah, I, I guess um, Alan's asking specifically, and if you don't have the date, that's okay. Maybe we can do some follow-up research on this or maybe someone in the audience knows he's, uh, wondering the specific date as far as the triggers for H.323 to become a success. So was it like a oh, 96, yeah. I, 97? I mean, or? I think it was, H.323 was um, a very active standards body for many years. And Eric, I don't know if you overlapped with that, but I mean, for us, it was definitely the second half of the 90s that we were actively involved in implementing H.323 solutions. The problem was the IP, you know, connections that most businesses had at least, you know, limited the number of streams. You certainly couldn't have H323 in every conference room the way it's it's very commonly, you know, Zoom rooms and other solutions are deployed today. Yeah, I think H.263, the video part of that was right in 1996 and, you know, Polycom, you know, was a very big proponent of that too, especially on the video and audio side, less on the data side, but uh, being able to do uh, you know, video conferencing over broadband. Sure. Yeah, I have some questions, but before I get to mine, um, I do want to uh, respond. I was trying to respond via typewriting and I hit the wrong button, but uh, someone asked the question, what technology did they use to do video in the 30s? And that's a little bit out of the uh, scope of this discussion, but I do uh, believe when I was studying up on it, they were actually using frequency modulation for the uh, carrier part of it. And of course, there were cathode, cathode ray tubes, CRT technology, right, for the for that sort of thing, but uh, just wanted to address that. Uh, Dave, I've got to ask, why did Bill Gates, uh, you know, actually kind of reminded me of my sister convincing me to buy a boat so they could use it, but why did Bill Gates, why didn't he just buy the, uh, the technology? Well, they were a software company and they, at that time, uh, did not make hardware and he did not want to compete with his customers. So he was selling software uh, to the computer companies, and he did, he thought that he'd make more money on software, which is really smart. 
and the the purchase of um, the technology, getting IBM to you know sell some rights to them to pay for it, was that your idea, or how did that come about? That was my idea. I had been talking. Brilliant. I, I Grove was against me, Bun, and uh, so I need to figure out a way to make this happen because I believe that it was worthwhile technology uh, for the future. So um, I had been meeting regularly with IBM about the PC and the direction of the PC and what we should be doing. And of course, we're having discussions with Compaq at the same time. Uh, and uh, IBM, of course, was trying to control the, the PC and the uh, PS2 uh, was their you know, attempt to do that. Uh, uh, but uh, they wanted to be much more involved in the technology decisions. Remember the PS2, they created their own new bus. Mm -hmm. uh, Intel soon got uh, you know, involved in USBs and PCIs, we created the PCI bus and do you know, the various standards around the PC and started uh, doing uh, uh, reference, we, we call them reference designs. Uh, we would design a PC and we didn't want to compete with our customers. We didn't want to make it. We just give the design notes to the Asians and they would go off and build the exact board, the exact set of components. Uh, so, but it, it helped the sales, it lowered the price, it increased the market, um, and they paid the full price for the microprocessor. So it was a winning strategy uh, for us. But, but the bottom line is, um, Gates didn't want to be in the hardware business because he didn't think that was a smart choice. So I see some parallels in one sense between what 8x8 was trying to do. You're fundamentally wanting to sell more chips, right, with some of your products. And then uh, that was clearly the strategy, it sounds like, Intel had for this. Is that the case? Well, the thing that drove us really was, I mean, we had to do the chips. But what drove us is selling microprocessors, the margin mm -hmm. within the processors. It was you know, extremely profitable product. And uh, if we had to sell the chips at a low margin, but we advanced the use of video in computers, we were going to advance the demand. Believe it or not, one of our big concerns was, what's the world going to do with all this computing power? Do there, are there applications <laughs> that can actually benefit from this computing power? Are we getting, we need to stimulate the demand for computing power because we were afraid there would be too much. <laughs> <laughs> You're outstripping the demand. Well, it's amazing with Microsoft. Microsoft would always design a new uh, Windows package or application package for the high volume computer that was in production because that made economic sense for them. But it always took more computing power than they estimated. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually worked out great for you guys. When we released the product, it drove the demand for our new microprocessor. And so they would never say, well, we'd say, well, you designed this for the 486. No, 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 no. The 286 and the 386 is where the market is. Look at the size of the installed base. And they would release it and it worked run like crap on a 386 and not at all on a 286. And you really needed a 486. And that went on generation after generation after generation. Uh, <laughs> them uh, underestimating the power requirements of their new features. So maybe you didn't really even need the video conferencing. You just needed to. Well, you know, you know it's going to turn out that way. We just kind of like it. Well, it happened well last time, and then oh, it happened again. And I don't know that we can count on this, but it happened a third time. So um, yeah, we we were looking at ways where we could increase the demand for computing power, and we saw a video. And we talked about how difficult it was in those days, and of course, one of the big issues was uh, uh, bandwidth. You needed. You know, the talk earlier, I think Brian did, said about about the how much difficult, how much more difficult it is to do compression and decompression if you got a little teeny pipe. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, some of our work on Ethernet in the original uh, book that we did with digital and HP on uh, Ethernet uh, was driven by the fact that we needed a bit bigger pipe to feed the greater computing power that we were producing. So we need to balance the system. That's how we got in the whole architecture labs business and setting the standards relative to the rest of the system is if the system can't keep up with our processor, who's gonna buy our processor? So it was all driven by processor sales. 
Well, and that, uh, and again, Brian, Martin, you might want to jump in this, but the whole H323 and Alan Weisberger points this out in the message, but it was driven initially by the whole land uh, architecture, right? You want to build a conference from one building to another, or maybe one room to another or whatever, right? That was the initial driver. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and, and even, you know, up until, you know, last few years, um, you were always able to do much higher quality video within the enterprise than, than going over the wide area networks. So yeah, that was, you know, we were probably at 10 base T if I'm remembering correctly back then. So yeah, there was a lot of bits available to move stuff around. And, and the question was, um, you know, how to, how to do it and, and how to, how the, for me, the, the hard part of H323 was always the admin side. It was a, it was a very complex protocol of, in terms of how it managed gateways and gatekeepers. Um, I don't think I mentioned it when I was giving my, my talk, but you know, we were still swirling around with all these different protocols, all these competing ways of doing things. Um, and and for, for me at least, and, and you know, I'm kind of reading, this is my view of history, uh, others can, can uh, disagree with it, but uh, for me, I, I remember I was sitting at a Microsoft event in 2003, and we were, at the time, we were having to support H323, uh, something called MGCP or Megaco. Right. Uh, there, there were just all these yeah. protocols, and no, nothing would talk with each other. And the world of protocols, even once you agree on a protocol, then you've got to interoperate and actually make both sides. So you have to have gateways or something in between. And... Um, but anyway, Microsoft came out with live communication server. They, the announcement I was at was at the end of 02. I think they launched the product in 03. And, and it surprised everyone because they said the only protocol we're going to support in this is SIP, Session Initiation Protocol, which is what we're still primarily using today for voice and video and, and sessions in general. Um, and, and I remember you know, looking at people around the room, and we were like, wow, Microsoft just made our lives a lot easier. So I, I really credit, I don't know who at Microsoft deserves the credit, but for me, they were the ones that kind of said, okay, SIP is it. <laughs> I think I had a t-shirt that said that. And uh, <laughs> Ever since then, at least from my perspective, we've only had to support SIP to interoperate with just about anything out there. And and that's part of the challenge, right? Is that you early on? I mean, you did have you know, I guess you still had ISDN. I mean, you sold you sold hundreds of thousands of units, I think, right, Dave? I mean, so you had that. You had other technologies uh, to get the. So you had to somehow have gateways and stuff, right? Yeah, for sure. And. Y y I don't want to declare victory on the bandwidth um, issue <laughs> either. I mean, upstream, you know, on my, I, I big fan of Comcast. I love their gigabit service, but frankly, I've only getting, uh, what is it? 40 megabits on a good day on the upstream. And so you start putting 4k video and my wife's using teams and both my kids are doing homeschooling and you got four people in the house, each using 10 megabits of, of video. Uh, plus everything else overhead, you know, it's still not enough. And so, you know, 5G, it, it's, it's, it's this endless game. I mean, we're, I, I love in the historical context, we're so much better off today, but I don't want to say that the problem is over. Bandwidth is still, uh, and spectrum in general, when you go to the wireless space, it's, it's still a huge issue. You know, well, you, oh, go ahead, Dave. You can't uh, blame uh, Comcast entirely, <laughs> or I'm sorry, your family entirely. Uh, the reason is, you know, I was president of Nortel for a while, and and it's all the carriers, including Comcast, will oversubscribe. That is, they will sell more gigabit channels than they actually have, and bet on the statistics that everybody's not going to be using a, a gigabit at the same time. And so you can have a plenty in your house, but you find out who's down the street because that's right. your cable. And what, what you wind up finding is that with COVID and everybody at home, it's everybody's family. So you're yeah. not just your family that's causing your slowdown. It's all the other families on your block. Yeah, I should yell out to my son right now. Actually, we've got fiber to the home here, so it's works pretty well. <laughs> but um, Eric, uh, from a compression standpoint, you know, you kind of talk about what was, but then you also talked about what is and what's coming from a a technology standpoint, to Brian's point, it just seems like there's more and more. I mean, I can picture virtual reality, virtual headsets where we're full motion walking around. What What are your thoughts on that 8K video? What do you What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, video compression, you know, is still being worked on, you know, by a lot of people. I mean, as, as I mentioned, H.266 just getting modified, AV1. There's more options these days, um, but I think you know the kind of the 
big new area that people are looking at is incorporating VR and AR into video conferencing by putting on a headset and you know seeing your whole team in your living room, right? You just, so you're, or if you want to around the table, huh? Right, you go around the table and talking to them, or doing some sort of AR with IKEA and you know walking through those salesmen and trying out different stuff and, and things. So you know, there's those are kind of a lot areas where a lot of new new companies as well as older companies, Microsoft, Apple, and Zoom are also working on. It's not just startups, of course. So there's you know especially now with uh, with the, with the COVID use, you know, it's just exponential. And so, you know, there are people working on lots of different aspects of it to improve it and incorporate it into the operating system, into your working environment, and phones, and everything. So, you know, it's still kind of in a sweet spot here, you know, even though it's been around for, you know, 30, 40 years, you know, going back to H.261, still improvements being made and still new ideas and still new uh, uh, applications you know, being incorporated. Well, and it's, um, it, everything kind of has to come together, right? It, like that initial block diagram I showed, you can have one parameter that's great, but if the others are lagging, then it's, you, you lose the experience. What is kind of the most important, you know, if you're prioritized you know, where, where things fit in a video conferencing? Well, I think it really depends on you know, if you're doing a home, I'm sorry, if you're doing a, a room video conference, right? Like using something like Polycom or Cisco, where you've got multiple screens, you've got dedicated lines, and you know, there it seems like resolution and frame rate, audio delay when you're doing a real time meeting, right? And you've got you know expensive equipment. If you're at home, you're on your phone, you know, everything, then you know, it's uh, be able to incorporate, you know, and use uh, appropriately within your app. You know, use, Within your applications and on your device, and there, whether or not the image is small or you know you miss a frame once in a while, that's not as, as critical, right? And it's uh, low cost use, so you know it really depends on the application and you know being able to incorporate it into your PC and Max, and you got another different uh, you know axis of, of usability. So there's no real answer there. It really depends on your use scenario. And I apologize. This questions were not scrolling for me. So I didn't see that there's a whole list of questions here. Um, we'll go to this one first, Brian. Um, when you were talking to the cable companies, I had no idea if it was doing part of the packet uh, cable specification uh, write up, but did it surprise you by the lack of interest in video conferencing from the cable companies and others? Yeah, I, I think it did. Uh, but then I was, a, I was a video head to begin with and a big believer in video. Um, we saw, you know, the bandwidth was there uh, with what was being done with Doxis to actually do some really killer video. Um, but yeah, I, I was surprised. I, I can't really explain what internally was going on with with that strategy, but because uh, we, I don't think we got exposure to it. But but just walking around the halls of Cable Labs, I we could tell no one, you know, it was a roadmap item for every cable MSO, but no one in that industry had concrete plans to deploy two-way video in the next 12 or 24 months, but they were all looking at two-way voice. And, and so that, that was a key insight for us to, to be able to shift our strategy to, to more of a voice first model. And with my ba based on my cable background, I would have to think that the other aspect of it is the, the upstream bandwidth has always been difficult for cable, but it was even harder back then with, you know, large fiber nodes and so forth. They just didn't have that much to share, but. Yeah, just coming out of the, you know, from, from the ISDN world or, or dial up uh, what Eric and I lived through on some of those really early video phones, uh, you know, there was potential there, but no, yeah. no appetite. Yeah, it makes sense. So here's one for Dave. Um, the uh, someone's commenting. He remembers when Andy Grove brought it all went all in on ProShare, pushing it to consumers long before the rest of the industry. Uh, he was uh, a great evangelist for it to, as a driver for microprocessor sales, as you said. Um, they were correct, but too early for broad adoption. So the question is, um, I lost the question. This thing scrolled on me. <laughs> The question, where to go? It was uh, what I think it was. What do what can entrepreneur entrepreneurs do to uh, time uh, get their timing right? Well, it's very interesting. Andy started out uh, as I said, he didn't want me to spend any money on on buying DVI, but he wound up being the biggest proponent um, in the '90s uh, when he saw the, the demand or the interest, or somehow he got the religion for um, uh, 
particularly ProShare. And ProShare was one of his pets that he really drove. And it was developed up in Oregon in the system product group. But funny story in 96 to 98, or 94 to 96, I was running the server business and we were launching our first big server launch for the Pentium Pro. And um, I had a bunch of uh, 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 industry leaders, Ellison and, and uh, Michael Dell and Bill Gates and uh, uh, people who are big in servers who were, I lined up to come on line with uh, satellite TV and speak in our big launch in New York City. And uh, Grove got wind of it and he says, no, no, you're gonna use ProShare. So we had to use ProShare and I had to get <laughs> ProShare and ISDN into Ellison's conference room, Michael Dell's conference room and everybody else's conference room. Uh, so he was, he was a, a big advocate of video in the, uh, the mid and uh, uh, late uh, 90s. Uh, I guess, what can we learn for uh, startups? Well, I guess the thing that I've learned over and over and over again, I don't seem to be able to remember it, is that <laughs> I understand where technology is going, but I'm really lousy at estimating the time. Remember uh, that uh, we used to talk about the year of the land, the year it was next year and then next year and then it was last year <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of happened and, and the same thing has happened with video and video conferencing thank god with covid that we've got video conferencing and we can do this can you imagine what this would have oh been my like gosh. 20 years ago uh what if you need an isd online to do this <laughs> <laughs> so, so the, i guess the lesson is um really understand the the timing uh, the direction is a lot easier than the timing for things happening. And uh, too many times I've developed something too early, too many times I've invested in something that was too early. And um, it, the market just has its own pace and, and you've got to understand that. Great advice. Yeah, Brian, are you, you could probably address it given how 8x8 has you know, s s new maneuvered these currents. Yeah, well, yeah. I totally agree with everything Dave said. Um, I, I think 8 byte was way, way ahead of its time in video. Uh, and I, I think you can even argue we were ahead of our time moving to voice over IP, but you know, that market did mature. It got to scale. Uh, you know, 8 bytes uh, a, a billion dollar company today because of, because of voice, not, not because of video. So yeah, timing is, is everything, whether it's the stock market or technology go to market or, or whatever you got to, if you don't get that right, nothing else matters. I've got to ask this question. I'll go back to the, the ones up there, but is, is then video a feature or is it the product? Video conferencing. Yeah, so I mean, my take on that and, and where, where we're taking a bite, you know, we're, we're becoming a platform company. And what I mean by that is all of our communications capabilities are actually now getting embedded into everything, right? So Internet of Things, um, so, so video to me is going to be a, a component, probably a necessary component uh, of just about any other platform that, that people are putting out there. And, and to a certain extent, again, it has been, but now it has to be. Um, it, it was, a, you know, whether you're talking to your Uber driver and wanted to see the person or not, or I gave the example of using smartphones in the field to enable contact center experts to solve problems you know, this, the capabilities to do that were all there. They just weren't being used. And, and now we're in a world where contactless means I have to use it. Um, and, and I don't think we're at the end all for collab either. You know, I, I like to refer to this, what we're doing here as this is a very two dimensional experience. And if, if Dave's nightmare had become true and we didn't have all this uh, and COVID had hit 20 years ago, we would have all been doing a 1D audio only conference, right? A, a rain, rain dance bridge or whatever your favorite tool was for audio conferencing. Um, but this isn't the ultimate for collab. It, it's hard to get to know people. It's hard to bump into people at a water cooler uh, with this format. And so collaboration's got all sorts of interesting advancements that need to be made and they need to be made yesterday. And so, you know, there's Timing, timing could not be better right now. So that's a, that's a time frame I know is now. And, and I think a lot of people are working on solving that. You know, so, uh, oh, good, that brought out with distant learning, one of the things, if you read the papers, I follow this a lot, 
because I'm very much involved in education. Uh, but uh, if you uh, the, what they're learning with distance in, uh, learning is that the content works, but the social part doesn't. So kindergarten is 100% social and graduate school is 90% uh, content. And uh, middle school is about 50-50. And so how do we get the social aspect uh, into this remote working? Because, man, if we can solve that one, we've solved a big, big problem. The transportation problem goes away. The real estate problem goes away. I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable. The, the holodeck comes to mind. <laughs> there you go. Maybe, the, you know, don't invest in that company. <laughs> So speaking of early days, and I'm going to jump uh, around here just to uh, distribute the questions among the people asking. Uh, in the early days, which market was the real motor, vo motivator of these developments in terms of potential use and profit? Was it corporations that needed methods of doing remote communication across buildings and geographic regions? Or was it consumer use? Uh, which of these two markets were expected to give us the biggest return on R&D? ProShark was on, oh, aimed at corporations. We marketed totally corporate. Yeah, I, I mean, telemedicine and distance learning were always verticals for video conferencing. And, and to a lesser extent, even the, the security market, which wasn't really a video conference, it was a one-way video conference where you were just monitoring sites using the same technology. And of course, with, uh, with uh, tele telemedicine, you get into all the other issues around HIPAA and all the regulations, right? So yeah, in yeah. the with, 80s and 90s, I mean, Big markets were, you know, companies that had offices, you know, distributed around the world, around the country. You have an East Coast and a West Coast office, and you want to have you have a room of ten people in San Francisco, a room of ten people up in New York, and you got weekly meetings. And instead of flying back and forth for those meetings, you do it in video conferencing. And of course, you have to be able to share screens, and it's not just video, but be able to integrate data and exchange uh, uh, PowerPoint slides and things like that. And so the focus really was on how do you make these kind of corporate meetings more efficient, easier to you know to use, and more seamless, especially all the UI and everything. And so that was really the core focus, I'd say, in the late '80s and through the '90s and the early 2000s. And this kind of gets into the culture of things. Uh, someone just commented on YouTube that uh, they agree with you, Brian, about the water cool interactions, uh, you know, completely lacking uh, now. Um, it also gets to the question that's asked here of, you know, what are your experiences as far as the, how the various co players at that time handled the user interface uh, of their products, what, you know, and what lessons were learned from that? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, fortunately, it's generally improved over time. Um, you know, we can now just one click into to almost every meeting. Um, like I said, WebRTC has eliminated the pre-installation or having to download something. That's, that's like a huge advancement. And the world, um, from my perspective, owes Google a huge debt of gratitude for driving WebRTC so strong the past couple of, you know, probably going on five years now maybe longer even now that I think about it. Um, I, I actually think it's, um, you know, it, it, it's an interesting problem. The, the peripherals that we all have to use seem to be like a huge challenge, right? You, you've got to have a camera. It's got to be set up right. Um, if you're Apple, you know, it's all built in for you. So they, they kind of have an advantage there. But the, the whole experience around speaker phones and echoes and audio fidelity um, you know, the higher end video room systems that, that Eric was talking about have been doing spatial sound for a very long time. People like Polycom, as you walk through the conference room, people hear through the overhead speakers, you know, your spatial perception appears to change. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of that's got to come to the everyday stuff that we're doing. If, if we're going to replicate the classroom in a way that enables kids to socially develop there, there we got a long way to go on the peripheral front i think yeah and it does uh there's a, a timely comment here as far as the, you know gets back to that social interaction and uh and, and ben reeves suggests in his weekly team meetings uh, they have an ice cream social so i guess i should have brought ice cream for all of us um <laughs> but in their case they've got one person in california or one team in california one in singapore and one in india um, so his point is it matters a lot what you're doing, you know, before and after the conference, you kind of have to be proactive. You yeah, know, we have, sure. uh, I have a weekly, uh, uh, cocktail party with, uh, three other couples, ex-intel couples. 
and it's been going on all during COVID. I've got another uh, monthly one. I've got periodic. So we're doing we're using Zoom a lot, and video conferencing a lot for social interaction. But how do you get the work people to you know bump into each other in the restroom? Right. I just that 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 aspect we haven't got a hold of yet. It is clearly easier when you have an established relationship um, as well. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's a huge problem that's coming. Uh, one of the reasons the the transition to work from home or school from home or everything from home worked overnight was we all knew each other for, for the most part. If, if you happen to join your job at the early part of March, you, you probably did not have this experience. But, you know, we all knew each other. We, we knew socially. We, we knew each other. That'll change very rapidly. You know, the turnover of Silicon Valley companies, two years from now, you'll, you'll have 50% of a workforce at a company is going to be brand new. They've never met face to face, never met in person. There, we've got to solve some of this stuff super quick, or we're going to lose, you know, culture and how, how companies really, you know, how you identify with the company you work for. Although even before COVID struck, a, a real tendency was to have uh, an engineering team in uh, Eastern Europe and a uh, CEO here in the Valley and a sales guy that lived in Austin and some, you know, et cetera. And so there has been progress made. Typically, there was a clump of people in, in place, you know, like all the engineers would be maybe in the, or, or 90 percent or 80 percent in one place. So we're, we're, we're inching our way here. But uh, all of a sudden, you know, we had a, a solid change and we're just we, we, we may have made a little progress, but we have big deficiencies on that whole side. Yeah, Matt Mullenweg, um, Auto, Automatic, the people behind WordPress and Word.com, they, uh, they've been doing this almost from the beginning. They actually have, I think, quarterly uh, get-togethers around the world where basically the whole company, of course, they're naturally a virtual company because it's all software, but, um, but this was a very uh, wise comment. Uh, uh, he will not be taking his Zoom conferences into the restroom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So uh, from a perspective of wireless and, and going back to the 80s and 90s, I remember my sister telling me, you know, someday we'll all have wireless phones. And, and my sister's kind of a Luddite, more Luddite than myself. And I thought, no, Terry, you're, you know, that can't happen. I was way wrong. But when you guys were doing this work back then, did you envision this going wirelessly? And, and think about that for a moment when the question was, uh, can you talk about the effects of moving from 3G to 4G uh, and the paradigm shift? that happened in those days. And of course, uh, there was 1G maybe uh, back in, you know, maybe the late yeah. 90s. So a lot of this stuff really, you know, was still pretty new, but uh, any thoughts on that? I'll give one example. You know, the, you know, when FaceTime first came out with like 3G you know, on the iPhone, it was just one-on-one -on -one conferencing. Now with 4G, LTE and faster iPhones, you can do, I think up to, you know, 16, right, on group iChat on, on uh, FaceTime. So certainly that's improved. That uh, once it goes to 5G, I'm not sure what Apple's planning, you know, <laughs> if they don't say, but I'm sure other companies are, you know, planning even make use of even more bandwidth and more complicated applications uh, uh, than that. But certainly going from single conversations to multi-point conversations, you know, was one possibility with 4G. Yeah, we, we never, I remember we never, I mean, Wi-Fi was always um, never going to be superior to plugging in. Uh, and I remember when we were oh, doing roadshows for investors with Via TV, first thing we do is we get in the investors conference room, crawl under the table, look for an ethernet port that we could plug in <laughs> uh, and make the video phone work. But, you know, Wi-Fi is, I mean, it has come an amazing uh, long way to where if you, you know, you can give me three megabits on anything and, and we can do HD video really easy. The, the, the improvement to 5G that I'm super excited about is actually the ultra low latency, okay. um, less than the band, because bandwidth is, you know, it's always going to be going up and to the right, but the latency that they're trying to get to the edge of the cellular network and, and use public cloud right at the edge. I think it was Eric mentioned, you know, to make these, these uh, augmented reality types of goggles work and so forth. You've got to be down in the like super low latency uh, period, and that 5G can do that. Yeah, and actually, that'll be a conversation that Alan Weisberger, will, I'm sure, will want to have on the ultra low latency thing. So stay tuned on that. Um, 
we'll ask one last question from the audience and I'll, I'll ask one more, but this might actually be related to the question I'll ask. So I'll kind of ask them two part here. Um, so the question was in the modern day tech stack for video conferencing, where are the spots that are in need of some revamping? You know, which things haven't been updated in a while or are there any bottlenecks in that current stack? And I think that kind of leads to the more general question. So that's one question that might be a Brian question, but the more general question of, you know, where do you see things and say, five years in 2025, or maybe 2030, or if you really wanted to be bold, uh, we could go back since we were talking 20, I guess 25 years ago, 30 years ago now, we could advance to 2050. So any of those time frames you guys want to answer uh, to give some thoughts on where video conferencing and the like will go. Um, okay, so I, I don't know that I want to touch the second half. The uh, <laughs> I, I never even get 12 months right, so I don't know how I'm going to predict 20. Um, uh, again, I think, and, and there's a lot of this work going on uh, in that Jitsi open source community I talked about, um, still optimizing the video bridging function to, to most optimally route. You know, the, the way these modern services work is not everyone in the conference is receiving the same bit stream that we used to have to, it'd be like the lowest common denominator. Whoever was the lowest, you know, everyone got that quality. And so, there's still a ton of work to optimize for the fact that you have a wide diversity of, 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 of network conditions and, and being able to figure out how to do that. And then the other one that's like just burning that probably is going to have to get resolved here super quick uh, is end to end encryption. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, again, tons of work uh, we've put out through Jitsi a proposal for how to do it. We invited the crypto community to tell us, what they saw that was wrong with it. And we've been getting really great feedback on that. Um, but at the same time, there's this public policy, like end-to-end -end encryption basically says the service provider, you know, there's no dial-in, there's no call recordings, it, everything is truly encrypted. And then you get into this issue of lawful intercept and people using, you know, video for, for illegal activities. And there's a, there's a public, um, uh, issue there that, that needs to be resolved. Because I honestly, in a true end-to-end -end encryption, I don't have the keys. So if the FBI, the DEA, whoever it is comes to me and says, Brian, we want to see what was going on in this conference. Well, you know, and, and those those debates aren't just in video. It's, you know, we saw that on the iPhone and other other use cases, but encryption in our in our new video COVID world, you know, I, I think is is um, needs a lot of work. I'll just leave it at that. You know, it's very hard to guess where the technology is going, Ken. Uh, much easier to project where the culture is going. And one thing we, we we're very, I don't know that we can go to five years or 20 years or 30 years, but one, <clears throat> one thing that's very clear is we're on a trend line. And it's kind of like Moore's Law. You can just trace it, just look at what we've done in the past and how it's going to change in the future. And we have this one big disruption called shelter in place which has forced us to jump forward on the, this adoption curve that mm -hmm. I talked about. I always, I always assume adoption is going to happen because the technology can be there. But what we've had is the, the adoption curve jump where, <clears throat> where we're using more of that. So the long-term consequences of that are very, very significant to mankind. Uh, uh, working where you want to work, living where you want to live. Uh, the attractiveness, one of the things <clears throat> that's happening is vacation homes are because the prices are going way up because everybody says, well, man, I, I can work remote, man. I, I, in my vacation home, that's a much nicer place. I want to be in the mountains. I want to be by the lake. I want to be in the desert or wherever. And <clears throat> uh, the uh, prices in big cities are going down. So the rents in San Francisco are dropping. And so um, what we'll have is... Um, and I don't know if that's, you know, how long that's going to happen, you know, whether it's five years or 30 years, but we're going to become unshackled from geography to a greater and greater extent with time. <clears throat> Just like processors got more and more performance with time, we're going to be less and less physical dependent with time. And it's, you know, technologies like this, and but it's impossible really <clears throat> to guess which technology is going to make it because everybody's got, you know, money on a particular direction and everybody therefore has a biased position and, and, and technology is so hard to predict anyway, but we know 
that science will solve this problem. And Eric, do you have any? Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the features that I know that people are working on are key is, you know, today you want to call someone, sometimes the biggest problem is the language, right? I want to call a company in China and talk to them about a product. They only speak Mandarin, I only speak English. Today it's a problem. I mean, there are, of course, Google has real-time translation apps or others, but I don't think any of them are integrated in to a video conferencing product like Zoom, for example, right? So I could just make a call and talk in English. They just talk in Mandarin and with low latency connection, you know, it'll be semi-natural. That will be really cool. There is just one last question. I think it'd be really quick. It's from Joseph Way. Uh, is there a video conferencing platform that provided ind independent bandwidth for video and audio? And I'm assuming what he's talking about is, is literally setting, dedicating the audio channel and a dedicating a video. So I guess if the video went out, you'd still have good audio or something like that. And um, I don't know if that's something that. So the, the challenge there is um, video coding typically takes a lot longer um, to do than, than voice coding. And so to maintain lip synchronization, you know, the streams were, were synchronized in, in a common stream. Um, you, you can certainly send voice and video, but I don't, I, I think you see this on some of the network news, the work from home news correspondence, the, the lip sync I've noticed is kind of, I don't know if yeah, they're inserting their, times their too, yeah. button to kill the voice if a four letter word gets said or whatever it is that's throwing <laughs> it off. But I've, I've noticed it's, uh, it's kind of all over the place right now. Well, I have to compliment all of you no four letter words today. So that's <laughs> very, very thank thankful for that because I didn't want to violate it, the FCC's rules again. But um, I really appreciate uh, you, all of your help in putting this together and your, your great uh, presentations today. And of course, the Silicon Valley History Committee for uh, organizing it and promoting it and the IEEE. And thank you for everyone who participated and watched. And I'm going to hit the stream in the stream on YouTube.